Hey everyone, it's me, Hawkeye G, and we're doing another campaign starter guide. This time, we're doing the Hexwaddle faction of the Lizardmen. It's the primary faction of the Lizardmen, and though it's not quite kept up with all the updates other races and factions have seen, it's still a pretty fun and interesting campaign. Uh, you start off very much surrounded, so we'll take a look at how that can play out, and uh, just kind of figure out what next moves you can take and different ways the campaign can shape up. With these campaign starter guides, I like to go over a quick overview of the campaign with some brief glimpses at how it plays out and what key points are, building in military considerations, any special buildings which might be important to you, or any army compositions that might be worth considering for your situation, uh, the short-term goals for the campaign, a brief plan for the early game that gives a good consistent start no matter the other variables, and then a long-term strategy look, which is a big picture look at how the campaign typically shapes up, what your major roadblocks might be, how different things can play out, and what your response should be, as well as what you're looking for there. If you are enjoying these videos, please remember to like and subscribe. Every new subscriber helps and likes show me what I should keep doing. With that being said, let's get into the video. So here we are on turn one. Like I said, I just want to give a quick overview of like how the campaign shapes out so we can kind of get things at a glimpse. Right, uh, You're surrounded uh, totally in terms of immediate foes and nearby foes. If we look at diplomacy, we can see we're already at war with three factions, and that's not to mention the Dark Elves to the north where Marathi is, uh, as well as to the south where we are going to have Marcus Wolfheart, as well as the Drowned here. We're not even at war with those people yet, but it's pretty inevitable that they're going to want to fight us. Um, basically, the only ally that you're really going to find is going to be Nagarith up here, uh, so it's worth trying to build some relations with them early on. One other thing I did want to mention quick is just what I was going to make our short-term goals here. Uh, you can see we've got these three provinces here, the Jungles of Papuelaksha and the Isthmus of Lustria. And basically my recommendation for the short term is try to take control of those provinces and wipe out most of these enemies that we've talked about in the near term. Jumping a bit ahead now, uh, we can see our short-term goals have essentially been achieved, and so it's time to initiate the long-term strategy. Uh, if you can, you want to help the dark or the High Elves win against the Dark Elves here, but you can see that's gone pretty well. We've got control of these provinces, have eliminated pretty much all the enemies that we mentioned previously, and we're starting to build diplomacy with the Lizardmen to the south. Uh, basically, we're in a safe and well-defended area. We have plenty of time before we really need to push out. We can work on either building up and managing diplomacy, or we can try to discover more people and more advantages. Uh, as much as we can, we want to determine the current situation in the south to see who needs help or which direction we should move in in order to give ourselves the best advantage and ensure that the Lizardmen secure Lustria for themselves. Uh, at some point between now and turn 100, we'll also have additional time to fortify and build up, uh, so it does, it does make it worthwhile to kind of push out here a little early on and try to give yourself some sort of advantage before needing to take a break or just running out of things to do. If everything goes well, uh, the results of the long-term strategy are going to be successful as well. We'll be able to gain control of a fair bit of territory. Uh, we might struggle with diplomacy with the high elves a little bit. Kind of sucks because you have this diplomatic relations penalty, but that's not really the biggest issue at play here. Uh, and we are on very hard difficulty for this campaign, so that has an impact on things as well. Uh, but you can see we have this place relatively secured. We're in good relations with the other lizardmen, and of course this is the phase at which chaos has appeared, which makes it a lot easier to kind of get relations built up with everyone. Uh, at this point, we have Lustre secured, uh, we have most of our campaign goals met, and what we really need to do is figure out how to wrap up the last few, uh, particularly of importance, are going to be like the control of eight of the following settlements by ownership or military allies, trying to get some of these major settlements under control. Uh, taking, you can see we have control of Lustria, basically, so we just need to wait for Chaos to appear and die, and we are probably going to want to go east to try and take some of the major settlements over here, as well as trying to find some allies in the High Elves to see if we can get that all secured. Uh, so that pretty much does it for the overview. Like I said, just kind of a quick, quick glimpse at the direction that I went in this campaign and, and where I think that you should go and where we're going to go in this guide. So with that being said, we're going to move on to talking about building and military considerations to get an idea of some of the things I think are important in this campaign. All right, so we're right at the bridge between the early game and the mid game of this campaign, so we can kind of talk about things and get a look at things uh, without being too overwhelmed, right? So, uh, like I said, building in military considerations, I want to talk about any important buildings I think you should take note of, or any good military compositions to consider for this campaign. So, uh, the first thing to look at is buildings, right? We have lots of landmarks in our first province. Let's take a quick look at these and what they do. So, of course, you have the Blessed Incubator. Uh, this is 
just insane. It's insane how good this is. Upkeep reduction for basically everything that's not a skink or Saurus, or essentially like this building, spawning pool and underground, like these two spawning pools, anything that's not that gets upkeep reduction, right? Pterodons, Ripperdactyl, Quaddle, Cold Ones, Ancient Salamander, Hunting Packs, Dreadsaurian, Bastilodon, Stegodon, Carnosaur, etc. Right, all of these units are going to get upkeep reduction and you get a bonus rare resource from this. Crazy good. We have Stellar Pyramids, right? Magic wins a magic increase for all armies, Lord Recruit Rank and Research Rate. Honestly, not as crazy good as the other one in my opinion, but wins a magic is still good. Small Lord Recruit Rank bonus and the Research Rate, which really you do need that as the Lizardmen. Moving over to the Fallen Gates, we have the Plateau of the Fallen Gates. Now this one I could see not being as useful if you don't think you're going to use Temple Guards and even if you do 5% upkeep for all armies reduction isn't that big uh, but the recruit rank is nice especially for your heroes having that bonus recruit rank and uh, this is a campaign where Temple Guard might be worthwhile at least because your, uh, your legendary lord has the upkeep reduction trait for them so I definitely think this is a useful building or at least worth our consideration. And then if we look at the Ziggurat of Dawn which has the last one Honestly, I don't think this one's that useful. Uh, 200 experience gain per turn is a pretty decent number, but are you really going to want you know armies sitting in your starting province? I, I could see maybe early in the game if you wanted to build this uh, to try and get experience and rank up your units ahead of time, um, but you don't. You probably don't want this in the late game. Recruit rank plus one for all units is nice, but you can get better results from that or better results than that from research. And then I will mention this in the short term section as well, uh, but we do have a nine slot capital. While this normally means we can go for economy and military together, I'll actually recommend waiting until tier three to get additional military variety because having more gold income early on will be important for the Lizardmen, right? You have this gold building and you have the actual like basic industry income building. And so being able to get both of those and a growth building in and just having basic source for uh, like skink cohorts for the first however many turns, is going to be better off for you, I think. As for the actual military considerations I want to talk about, I think there's a couple options to consider. Uh, first is just using lots of skink cohorts with javelins, right? They're not amazing units, but they're disposable and easily replaceable, right? No matter where you are, you're going to be able to recruit these units uh, to fill into your armies. You can always just merge them and recruit. It's only ever going to take you one turn, pretty much no matter where you are. Uh, so you can just combine that with a bunch of Saurus warriors and being able to just attack the enemy army, set up nice like bait and flank options. Uh, you can keep it pretty minimalist if you're trying to push, if you're trying to like save yourself until you can get some of these more like late game units and higher tier units. I think that's one option, just, you know, basic simple army. Next option I want to talk about is going um, Saurus and Croxigar into Temple Guard and Sacred Croxigar. It's mainly a mid game strategy you can use and specifically with Mazda Mundi because Mazda Mundi has that trait, if we grab him here, where you get 50% upkeep reduction or upkeep cost reduction for temple guards units, right? So that's, and uh, in addition, actually we'll go back here. If we look at the sacred guardian, of course, Crocs score, sacred Crocs score, and temple guard units all are on the same skill tree. Uh, so it just kind of has that unit synergy, right? The temple guard or source units pin things in place, the Crocs scores come in and smash them. And so uh, early on in the game, you might want to try to find room for the skink building so you can get Croxagore. And then once you hit uh, tier three or well, tier four to get the temple guard right, once you're into the mid game, you take the temple guard building uh, tier four, well, you get this upgraded and you need the weapons crafters commune, right? But this will give you access to temple guards and sacred Croxagore. So you're making good use out of it. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't go into other options, but just being able to kind of filter in your armies with some Temple Guard, uh, perhaps some Saurus and Skink Cohort to fill the gaps, and then uh, just some Croxagor, right? I think that that's a viable campaign for you. Um, the Temple Guard hold the line and create blobs for your Croxagor to splatter. Uh, in the early game, you can probably swing the Croxagor with Saurus for similar effects. I know that this won't work as well on higher difficulty, and honestly, the biggest downside of this composition is the overall like slow speed of it. The Croxagors are going to be your fastest unit, so it, it can be kind of hard to navigate and might not counter uh, missile-heavy armies quite as well, uh, but it's definitely a fun camp composition to use, and uh, really, it, it's one of the two ways to gain an advantage over your early game enemies, right? You have Norska here, you have Empire here, you have Dark elves to the north and then you have skaven that start in here as well as uh, more vampire coast and more empire further down right 
some of these people are going to have monstrous units, but many of them don't, right? They're going to be missile heavy armies. So you want to use like you're trying to find compositions that can give you an advantage. And since you have so many different enemies here, you want to just focus on your strengths. So that's why I recommend going either infantry and monstrous infantry heavy or our next option, uh, which is what I end up going with in this campaign. Uh, you, of course, same route economy early on in Saurus with Skink Cohort until you hit tier three, in which case you can add in the Pterodon Hatchery, uh, specifically Fire Leech Bolas, right? The Pterodon Rioters with Fire Leech Bolas is what we're looking here. You use this to do damage to their infantry as they're approaching your lines. You then have your Saurus Warriors hit their front lines. Um, and since you're, you know what I mean, your infantry is already good and their infantry will be damaged, you'll break their front lines quite easily. Then this allows your Saurus and your Pterodons to start attacking and chasing down their archer lines. Uh, you probably even want the Pterodons to be chasing down the fleeing infantry. Uh, this way all their units stay on the run from you, right? Now uh, you can see I've kind of taken some of the cheaper options here to keep things down. I really don't need this Croxicore, but you start the game with it and sometimes I'm stubborn about that stuff and plus he's really high rank, blah blah blah. But anyway, yeah, you want your Pterodons to chase down the fleeing infantry uh, and then you have your Source Warriors chase down their archers, right? You can keep damaging and uh, forcing their infantry to retreat, reducing their numbers heavily, uh, reducing the likelihood that they're going to catch you and stop you from attacking their archers. And even though your Source Warriors are going to be slow, uh, it's not going to be too difficult to have them chase down the archers and keep those pretty spread out. Um, it can get quite chaotic and spread out though, so it can be risky and it will cause you to lose units if you're not keeping careful track of them, right? Uh, so like I said, again, the reason I suggest these army compositions is you're playing into the Lizardmen's strengths, right? I, I can't say nobody has flying units, right? The Dark Elves could definitely get some flying units and some monstrous units, but like the Empire's not going to have that. Norsk is not going to have that really. Like they'll have the monstrous, but they won't have flying until later. Uh, Vampire Coast can again get monstrous units, but just because it's something that you have access to at a pretty early stage of the campaign, uh, I think it's worth considering that option. Otherwise, obviously, tear down Riders with Fire Leech Bowls are just an insanely good unit, and you can get access to these quite early as well. So I think that those are the main ways that you gain an advantage with your military compositions in this campaign, uh, just by making use of things that other people either don't have access to as early, don't have as effective enough of units, or just in general you push your strengths, even though you know these missile heavy units are gonna count are gonna work well against your um, whether you pick the flying units route or the monstrous infantry route, you'll be able to combine that with the use of your own infantry for effective results. So that covers everything I wanted to for the building and military considerations. With that, let's take a look at, uh, let's go back to turn one and talk about our short-term goals for this campaign and then walk through how to achieve them. All right, so here we are on turn one. Uh, it's time to talk about our short-term goals. Uh, so our short-term goals for this campaign aren't too different than most other campaign. Uh, obviously, we need to gain control of our starting province here. Uh, I like to typically establish a solid three province setup. Uh, it's important for the Lizardmen as well, and it's, it just works out nicely here uh, with the two jungles of Pahualaksha and then the Isthmus of Lustria. It's a really nice defensible position. It's going to give us control of a lot of good territory, and it's going to eliminate a lot of our enemies. Uh, right, and that's another one of our objectives is eliminate basically everybody here. There's Skaven in the Fallen Gates. We have Skeggy here. We are hoping to deal with the Cult of Pleasure successfully. We want to kill the New World Colonies. There's the Drowned, the Blue Vipers, and perhaps potentially Mar Marcus Wolfheart down here to deal with as well. Uh, so that's all going to be part of the short-term goals. And then we also want to try and establish some positive diplomatic relations with other factions and work towards confederations as well, uh, whether that means being able to get some trade deals going with the High Elves if we can, or eventually discovering the Lizardmen and starting to build those relations before we finish things in the short term, that would be good. Uh, the main thing that I think is important at the start of this campaign is the ba careful balance of power. Uh, like I showed earlier, you know, we have three separate uh, enemies that we're at war with, right? And it's it's really hard to balance the power, right? You're surrounded by enemies at close range, but also at mid range up here in the north with the Dark Elves, further down south with the Greenskins, the Vampire Coast, and perhaps even the Empire, right? Uh, and if you're on a high enough difficulty, the enemy can simply outbuild you in terms of military early on in the game. Uh, in fact, that's what happened to me over the course of this campaign. You know, you have to have enough income to be able to like make buildings when you can like when the the build time comes up. But if you don't have a big enough army, the AI just builds a bigger army than you and says, oh, you're weaker than me, declare war. So you can get stuck in this province and even in your starting settlement very easily, right? Um, so it can be more of a defensive campaign to start with, and it requires a careful balancing act, or at least a little bit of luck in your favor. 
All right, so discuss the actual turn one here and just what kind of happens. Uh, the first turn, of course, you want to fight the Norska here, the Skeggy, uh, but then I actually recommend moving west to the Fallen Gates and wiping out the Skaven here. Uh, even with just some basic forces, a uh, combination of your Soros Warriors and some Skink Cohorts that you can recruit on the way, you'll be able to take the fight against the Skaven pretty easily, as opposed to trying to fight the Norska at Skeggy. It's going to take you a couple turns to get there, you can't recruit, and you probably won't be able to have the... F like, it's going to be a much harder fight, and it's going to leave you severely weakened. So definitely recommend backtracking a little bit, right? Uh, when it comes to buildings, uh, I would, like I've said before, just go for income and growth, right? At this point, you don't really need any specialized units. You can hold out a little bit longer, and you just want to make sure you have the income to support a decent enough army to keep yourself at a rival strength level with everybody else in the area. Moving forward a little bit, uh, you can see we're kind of trying to position ourselves to get in reach of Skeggy and uh, get a visual on them. Uh, we've got a decent sized army, but the problem with the Norska is just that you're basically going into a mirror matchup. You're going to be staking your infantry against theirs, uh, so it's going to be hard to get a good outcome without some kind of advantage for you. Uh, additionally, you have the New World Colonies nearby, and I feel like they can be a coin flip. In the Vortex, they seem to be friendly more often, but in this campaign, they tend not to like you. They're also just a great target to attack and sack for wealth, because they've got these two settlements that are so spread out, and they don't usually travel through uh, the sea very effectively, or they just don't think about it. It's easy to kind of attack them and get some get some stuff built up. Uh, yeah, the problem is that Norska often just sits in their settlements, you don't get a good advantage, and uh, ultimately I think it's typical to end up waiting until your capital reaches tier 3, and you can get some more military buildings in there to give you the diversity you need to overcome these obstacles successfully. So yeah, you can see we're a little bit further here. Uh, if we take Port Reaver, we can actually kind of slip out into the sea if there's any sea treasures there. It can be a good way to spend your time. Uh, we're also trying to make sure that we have the garrison in the Fallen Gates because around now the Cult of Pleasure is likely to start attacking you. Uh, and if things go really well, they're just going to throw their forces at this uh, city. You play out the battle and they just lose repeatedly and end up weakening themselves in their other wars. Uh, you also this point uh, right I'm, I'm positioned here i want to try to ambush them but you can see figure out of dawn i've just captured this uh from the new world colonies i have no troops in here and this ambush doesn't work out like it doesn't get detected the norska just don't ever they it seems unlikely that they leave this settlement they just sit there and wait so yeah, you kind of want to wait until you can get yourself one of the military advantages using one of the compositions that i talked about earlier in this guide uh, in order to give yourself the advantage you need to win this fight uh, without struggling too much even without a numbers advantage and without taking too much damage yourself. Moving forward a bit again, uh, really, once you have your starting province secure and that little bit of variety in your army like I talked about, uh, you really should be able to start pushing out. Most of the enemies at the mid-range that I talked about earlier are just not going to be consolidated enough to resist you, right? So that means we can probably wipe out the New World Colonies, the Drowned, and perhaps even the Hunts Marshall's Expedition with relative ease. Uh, and you can even see here, Nakai is at least doing well enough to have somehow taken their the Hunts Marshal's original territory and somehow pushed them up here into Pahwaks, which honestly works out great for us. Allows us to eliminate an enemy that we are going to want to eliminate in the long term, but we can eliminate them much earlier on, right? Uh, this is also a good time to start building diplomatic relations with other Lizardmen. It's very likely that you will have kind of discovered some of them here, right? Uh, like I said, in this particular campaign, Nakai did a little bit better than usual before dying. So the defenders of the Great Plan kind of have some obstructive territory in a way, but I was able to get deals with them pretty easily. Uh, the Cult of Sotek seems to be doing about as normally as well as they normally would, uh, perhaps even a little bit better here. Um, but so we can easily get diplomatic agreements with them. I definitely recommend it with the Cult of Sotek and with Itza, uh, because you're going to want to confederate them, get their legendary lords if you can, add that power to your own. The defenders of the Great Plan are easy to get on good terms with, but honestly I are probably not worth uh, confederating, obviously because they just have these, like, like they're not actually building up these settlements for you, so in a way they're more of a nuisance. Uh, I mean, you can see I already made agreements with them in this game, and I end up just, like, what happens in the end is Itza attacks them and pretty much wipes them out, and so it was kind of a mistake for me to, well... To, to get the military access in the first place isn't so bad, but you don't really want to push for confederation on them. They're not one of the Lizardmen factions you should focus on confederating. Um, and yeah, even if they grow to dislike you, 
It's not like they can do anything to you. They used to be able to do the Rite of Primeval Glory, but I believe that they patched that out some time ago because I'm not able to find anything on that right now. So yeah, being friendly with them might actually help you with hurt with some Lizardmen factions, but it can hurt you with others. So uh, just kind of looking forward, right? I, I know we've got enemies here and this territory isn't secured, but in my mind, this is already over, right? There's no, none of these people have anywhere near the amount of territory we have. We have the unit diversity that we were looking for. We're going to be able to push them to the brink very easily. And thus, with proper defenses set up in the north and a decent army to move out with, you really shouldn't have too difficult of a time overcoming the remaining enemies. Uh, like I said previously, they just don't have enough time to consolidate and build up, right? When you have a full province under your control and these people have two settlements at most, even on very hard with the, the bonuses that they get to their base income and everything, it's just not enough, right? It might be tough to get good combat situations. You might have to either put yourself in range and in camp in order to get a little bit of bonuses, bait them into attacking you or over committing their whole army and, uh, and playing it out manually and winning it. Uh, otherwise, using ambush and combining that with the right for increased ambush chance, right? Plus 50% ambush chance in a region that can already have, you know, 100% chance. It's pretty good. We, yeah, we don't even have that right active right now. And I want to say he has ambush resist. No, he does have ambush success chance. Yeah, so it's it's really actually not that difficult to ambush people as the lizard men, right? Uh, ultimately, it's about setting up an army you're comfortable with and picking the right time and place to fight your enemy. There's also a good chance that some settlements will be ruins as well, right? It's a good idea to spawn like a single lord to scout these. You can search the ruins for magic items and a little bit of gold and then settle them. It's maybe not super worth it, but if we already have these and it's not crucial that we take them in a single turn, two turns to take each one of them might be fine. Kind of gives you time to offset the cost of them as well. And then, uh, yeah, continue working towards improved diplomatic standing. If the high elves are willing to trade, that can be a really good thing for you. Uh, you'll kind of discover them naturally, and even if they don't really like you all that much, they're still usually very willing to trade. You don't necessarily want to band together with everybody. You kind of want to keep the main factions on your good side and try to avoid, you know, allying yourself with the people that they're at war with, you know, as I have here. But in general, just kind of checking these things to see who's friendly with who uh, so that you don't end up crossing too many diplomatic lines. Um, but yeah, continuing to build diplomatic relations with other people uh, and trying to explore. I mean, we don't have a good opportunity to explore down here, but that's okay. If high elves are willing to trade, it's a good idea to get those builds, uh, those deals going and potentially starting to convert some of your income buildings over to the special resource buildings or at least just getting the special resource buildings where you can. After all that, you should have full control of the three provinces we set out for. We are technically missing a single settlement, uh, but we should be able to either confederate for it or simply disband our agreements and wipe the faction out later. Don't forget to be checking the sea for various sea treasures as well, right? It's a, it's a campaign where, despite having a lot of tools to get, generate income, you also are going to have expensive armies, and you just aren't going to have the same capacity for income that some other races do. So keeping an eye out for sea treasures that you can get and uh, capture can be a great way to gain yourself some income. Since your economy might struggle at times, but your army is not, you want to take advantage of that as much as you can. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to discuss at this point. Right? It's easy enough to make simple blunders or overextend early on, right? When you just have the one settlement and surrounded by enemies. But if you can avoid this and be careful, uh, it's also easy enough to get momentum in your favor and sweep this area clean, more or less. From here on out, we'll move to thinking about the long-term strategy for this campaign, seeing as our short-term goals are achieved. And so let's talk about that. So what do we need to do to win this campaign? Let's take a look. We need to take over Lustria. That's basically what this is telling us. These are all provinces in the southern Lustria region. We have to build three star chambers. Should be super easy. Even if you forget about this the entire game, you can turn around and do this in three or four turns. We have to destroy some factions, which is already complete. And I want to come back to this. Um, we'll talk about this in a second. But you have a few factions that you need to destroy specifically. We also have the usual control eight major capitals. This might require some diplomatic efforts later on. And then, of course, the elimination of chaos. Okay, so at this point, the first thing we do is, well, next we need to look to Lustria, right? We need to control this territory to win the campaign. So this is the next thing we want to do. I think it's worth first mentioning Morathi and the Cult of Pleasure. 
Uh, I have assumed she's dead for you by now as well. Uh, she made terrible decisions in my campaign, like I said. Attacked the Fallen Gate City repeatedly and just failed every time, right? I mean, you can see some of these units have some experience on them. How wild is that, right? Uh, but she just threw her armies at the Fallen Gates, died three times in a row, and that gave Nagarith the edge that they needed to take her out. If she's still alive, especially if she's doing well, now might be your best chance to cripple her. While you have like secure territory, and if you have friendly people on your borders, it's it's worth considering like fighting her or making a concentrated effort to beat her. Uh, if she's really powerful, you might save it for later. If she's ignoring you for some reason, maybe save it for later. But ge generally, it's something you at least want to consider. You want to check in because we do have to eliminate the Cult of Pleasure. Their territory is terrible for you, but it's definitely something to consider, right? I'm not even sure you want to take control of her territory because of the uninhabitable climate. You might as well just wipe it out. But yeah, if you can, if you can take her out. It's, it's useful, right? If you can do this, it gives you time to build up your current settlements in relative safety so you can be stronger for your next push out. Now, getting back to Lustria, things can be very different here from campaign to campaign, so it's often hard to protect or predict. I think the most significant thing in this campaign that's different is Pestilence is dead, right? If we go back to that victory conditions page, right? Eliminate Clan Pestilence? I did not notice this when I was playing through the campaign, but Clan Pestilence is dead. Usually, they, like, win over Itza slowly but surely, but at this point, Itza has already eliminated them from the game. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Awakening usually is doing better against the Lizardmen here, and again, in this campaign, they're just not doing as well. They really only have the one settlement, right? You can see they don't even have any strength right now. If I had an army there, I could just take their capital at this point in time. So, in a way, this is good, right? The Lizardmen are winning instead of being dead. On the other hand, it does make them a little bit harder to confederate, right? It, it's much easier to confederate somebody when you can have multiple like combat situations against their enemy and you can catch them when their power is low so that you can confederate them more easily. Uh, you can see it's going to be going to be tough for me here and and especially with Itza having eliminated clan pestilence, we may not even have a common enemy. Uh, but that's just a note about this particular campaign, right? In general, for your campaigns, you should look for the following. Uh, first, the Jungles of Green Mist. For whatever reason, this province usually stays unsettled, and it's just free ruins for you to grab. Scout it. You can probably take this whole province for free and just settle it, right? Next, you want to look at the balance of power between the Cult of Sotek and the Vampire Coast. Who's winning? Is there a chance to confederate? Who else is involved, right? Again, in this one, the Cult of Sotek has an advantage, but most of the time I see the Cult of Sotek kind of lose slowly but surely. So depending on where they're at, you might want to get yourself involved, right? Uh, this would be your first available conflict, so you'd want to participate in it. From there, you want to find out what you can about the Blessed Dread and Clan Pestilence down here, right? Any wars you can involve yourself in, even if only to be at war status. I mean, you can see we're at war with the Awakening. I'm not going over there like right now, but this is going to help give me a, a small relations boost with any factions that are also at war with them, right? Uh, it's also possible that the Hunts Marshals expedition may still have a foothold here, and of course the Dwarfs and the Sentinels of Jati may still be alive. Uh, so basically I look at it as having two main options. You, one, you push into the southeast, right? You might have to fight the Hunts Marshal, you might have to fight the Awakening, uh, it should be to help with the Cult of Sotex view of you in order to help get confederation with them. And in general, should be able to get you a decent control zone and view of the continent, right? If you can kind of take territory down to this line, like these three settlements, if you have these three settlements, the rest of this is pretty secure for you. The other option is to push down the left side. You have a free province to take here, like I said. You also have the Sentinels of Jati, who should be very easy to kill and give you an extremely safe and defensible province down here. Um, and basically you make this decision based on how well the other factions are doing. If Itza is in danger of dying or the Cult of Sotek is in danger of dying, you it helps to take the pressure off them so you they can survive and you can get them confederated. Otherwise, if, they, if you have time, it's better to go to the Southwest. Let these people make their own mistakes and lose their stalemate to increase your chance of being able to confederate them. Uh, the only real downside to this is if they do too well, like with what happened with Itza and take over a lot of territory and become strong themselves, it might be hard to confederate them. It might even lead to war on some higher difficulties. But in general, I do think that this you should move forward at this stage, right? Whether it's 
to go up here and kill off the Cult of Pleasure while kind of leveling up your settlements, or to give yourself a foothold somewhere in Lustria, I kind of recommend that. Even though we have three settlement or three provinces that are still fairly low level, need some building up, uh, you don't necessarily want to wait. Like, I know... I know that we'll have time later on in this campaign to kind of let things settle, build up our settlements, not overcommit on military and have such a low income, right? There'll be an opportunity later in the game uh, to do that. So for now, you probably want to push out, right? There's always time to play slow and build up later, and we'll see that happen in this campaign. So, as you probably would have guessed, for my campaign, I ended up going down the west side. I chose this route since the Cult of Sotek was already winning against the Vampire Coast. Uh, again, at this point, I didn't actually realize Pestilence was dead. I don't think it would have changed any of the de decisions I made, though. Uh, so I easily took over the jungles of the Green Mist, and it was all ruins. Um, and then the Sentinels of Jati already have a lot, like, they have a good amount of territory, and they already really dislike me. Uh, I did choose to wipe out Tlaxlan. They had so little territory, and I don't like confederating something like that due to the penalties. However, it might have been beneficial to let them live like into the later stages and then just confederate them then when it's easy. Uh, just because they're going to be able to build it up to a high tier. I mean, but you could see they, uh, if I captured this from them, they had it at tier 2, right? It's You kind of have to gauge how much you can gain versus how much you would lose. And I didn't see that I had too much to lose by fighting them instead of confederating them. But uh, frankly, I actually might have been better off leaving them alive and instead trying to wipe out the Defenders of the Great Plan. Uh, just because they have this, like, it'd be better if I had this territory and could develop it. They're kind of blocking it. And in the end, Itza comes through and wipes out the Defenders of the Great Plan, which makes for kind of an awkward situation, right? So you just kind of have to pick your direction, start moving on it. And uh, from there, use the information you gather to make your next move. Like I said, the... We're still in such a great position here that I'm just going to take out the Sentinels of Jati and take their territory as well. Before too long, you should have the Sentinels wiped out and have control of some pretty good territory. Uh, alternatively, if you went southeast in the originally in order to help the Cult of Sotek, you probably would have already pushed the Vampire Coast to the brink, if not eliminated them completely by now. And this is where we really have a lot of time to build up, right? All our, any of our enemies here are in shambles, if not entirely dead. Uh, we have so much territory and actually have a decent income finally. We really don't have any significant military threats. So now's the time to consider like doing some recruitment to fix your armies, right? If they're still kind of on some of the uh, older tech that you have, you might want to swap them out. Might be time to build some new armies, maybe even scout some sea ruins and stuff. Definitely time to make sure that you have all the buildings that you want in a province and that you're building them up to, to kind of give you the things that you're looking to get, right? Uh, it's also where you want to build up relations with either the Cult of Sotek or Itza or, I mean, ideally both. Uh, to try to work towards confederation, right? We want to confederate Cult of Sotek here. We want to get Itza on our good side. Uh, it was difficult this campaign because Itza has a natural aversion to us and they're already so big that we don't have like a good uh, a good balance of power advantage over them. Uh, but yeah, it's also a good time to position yourself to finish off either the Vampire Coast or perhaps make a move on the Sentinels of Jati, depending on which route you went initially. But yeah, this is this is kind of where you're going to find that downtime phase, somewhere between, you know, turn 70, turn 80, turn 90. It's very likely that you will have pushed most of your enemies kind of to the brink, and all you really have left is allies, so you can kind of play defensively and work more on building up at this, st at this stage. So before we move forward, uh, there is actually one more thing I wanted to mention here. You know, I've talked about how we're going to have some downtime here to build up, you know, kind of get our economy straightened out, kind of get our forces set up, and uh, perhaps, you know, get our armies recruited up to a slightly more advanced tier. Uh, but one thing I want to make a point of is, right, next, the next thing I'm going to recommend, and I'll get more into the details later, I'm going to recommend we go east, ultimately, uh, past turn 100, to kind of, that's like where our end game is, or at least something to occupy our time, right? But you want to start planning that or start working towards that now right especially if things are looking nice and consolidated here if, if it's safe to leave this continent because everyone here is your friend which we'll fix this in a little bit but 
when everyone here's your friend, you want to be able to move out. Uh, in this campaign, I, I basically get over here to the east, uh, essentially just a turn late. I have an army that would have been fully recovered after taking attrition through the sea, hit, hits uh, some coastal territory. I confederate Talakwa instantly, um, but the army ends up getting trapped by the Greenskins, who happen to be extremely powerful in this campaign. So you, as much as we have the downtime, you don't necessarily want to waste it by doing nothing. One thing that you can do is start exploring and even sending armies east to prepare for this incursion because even a turn or two can actually make a difference here. So at this point, it's likely that you'll have Lustria secured or at least be well on your way. Uh, it might not belong entirely to you. It depends on the success of the other Lizardmen and your ability to confederate them. If they did poorly, you can save them. If you did well, hopefully, if they did well, hopefully you can ally them. Uh, but from here, you're kind of in an awkward spot, right? The thing is, it's hard to find the right target to go for next. Um, you can see we at least have good diplomacy bonuses from the Chaos Invasion, allowing us to befriend Itza pretty easily. So Lustri is wrapped up. Where do we go from there, right? If the Dark Elves are doing well and presenting a serious threat, maybe you could go to the north, except that territory is just terrible for you, right? Uh, you could go to the High Elves and try to attack their island, uh, but really with the territory that you have visible to you at this stage, they're probably your best ally, your best option for an ally instead of, uh, you know, conquest. And it's going to be tough to kind of, they're probably going to be powerful at this stage and def attack, like, successfully attacking and defending on all fronts, difficult. Uh, I think the best option is actually to go east. This is all going to be very viable territory from you. You might even find Talakwa or Krokgar here and be able to acquire a couple more, uh, either allies or confederate legendary lords. And uh, like I said, the terrain will be suitable here for you. You could potentially ally the Tomb Kings, but I think honestly you're better off taking whatever land can be useful for you. Uh, the reality is that at this point, all we need is controlling Lustria and getting eight major capitals. You can get a lot of capitals in the east, specifically uh, Skavenblight, Sartosa, and Miragliano. Somehow all three of these count as major capitals. Really easy to grab those and potentially Kemri as well. It should also go without saying that the Dreadfleet should get wiped out uh, and you would take Galleon's Graveyard, but I'm just saying it to be sure. And uh, that pretty much does it. If you can make it to this point in the campaign, like I said, it's kind of it's kind of awkward to figure out what you're supposed to do next and what will take you to a win. But this is going to be a really safe place for your campaign, right? Easily defensible position, uh, not that many enemies directly threatening you, and plenty of options of where to go next, or at least uh, a couple of good ones, right? So you should at least be in good shape. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to say. Thanks for watching this video. I hope that it helped you learn something about this faction or about some of the strategies you can employ to have a successful campaign as Hexwaddle. Uh, there's a lot of, like I said, the in early game is really interesting and it's a delicate balance. And uh, things can be very different each time you get to Lustria. So don't necessarily expect that it's going to look like what you see here. And in fact, uh, it could go better for you or it could go much worse. Uh, the only way to know is to play for yourself and find out. If you did enjoy this video, please remember to like and subscribe. Always helps me out. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.